Could you give me your full name? Ernest Frank De Soto. D E S O T O. Okay, and and where you, where are you where are you from? Well, I was born in Tucson, Arizona, from an old settlement family. I'm a descendant of the Presidio Commander of the Military Board of Tucson, who was a military commander from uh, from Spain originally, and as a military, he was put in charge of the fort. And uh, at that time, there must have been maybe only 200 families inside the fort because the Indians were harassing the settlers and uh, they needed military uh, protection. Well, there weren't too many military protection soldiers, so they built this fort to protect the settlers. Well, anyway, that's, that's I'm a descendant of the Presidio. Good. And, uh, well, when, about the age of three or so, I showed a propensity for drawing, for art. And I was encouraged by both by my mother, who was very creative and she sang, and um, my uncle, who was a priest, Franciscan priest, gave me a painting set because he had painted also. And um, he decided that I needed something like that. So I started painting. And then I was encouraged all the way through school. My teachers liked my work all the way from the principal on down and because uh, I drew almost all the time. And so through all through school I was encouraged and ultimately I went to art school in at the Chenard Art Institute in Los Angeles. And from there I went into military into camouflage. So I, I wanted to do art so I joined this camouflage unit in Hollywood and we went all over the South Pacific learning how to camouflage buildings, airport, air, aircraft industries, and uh, body camouflage. And a lot of the people in the uh, industry were all from Hollywood. So it was full of creative people like Studio Grips who built models and sets and uh, model builders who built boats and ships and whatever. So, I mean, it just went on from there. And, and like I say, after the war, I came back. I even, even while I was in the service, I painted. Could we and, stop a second? Yes. Thanks. Well, I found it fascinating. And because I wanted to stay in the arts, I, I was encouraged by people like uh, chemists who worked for Max Factor for cosmetics. And uh, I used to go into Hollywood I was stationed in Marchfield in Riverside, California. And we used to go to the studios for any excuse they wanted because they wanted to get back with their friends, you know. So interestingly enough, I was in on the film in Casablanca with Humphrey Bogart and so forth. And that was very interesting and exciting to me. But nevertheless, when the war was over, I went back to art school and was on the GI Bill which meant that uh, I could study anywhere in the world. And I decided to go to Mexico because my teachers at school said that uh, they taught me all, all they could teach me. So I was on my own. So I went to Mexico with several other um, art, uh, art students. But while I was in art school, uh, there was a printer in town in Los Angeles called Lynn Kistler, who was a German lithographer who was the only one printing for well-known California West Coast artists, like June Wayne, be one example, and Dan Lutz, and uh, a lot of the stu uh, Disney people, studios, uh, designers. And uh, so uh, that's when I did my first lithographs, which he printed. And uh, in the end of his career, he donated all those prints to the Smithsonian, which I have about three or four lithographs of the Smithsonian notes, which, which was good for me, you know, but nevertheless. So I went to Mexico and I started meeting important artists like 
Cicado is the mayor of Painter, and Orozco and Tamayo. And uh, uh, this artist, artist from Yucatan, I forget his name. But anyway, so I soon began to teach at San Miguel. And uh, then I met my first wife there. She was a student from Cleveland. She had graduated from Ohio State. And, So there was a, an uprising in San Miguel because Cicados decided that the teachers weren't paid well. And as a matter of fact, the, the owner of the school uh, was receiving payment from the GI Bill, the United States government, and in turn hiring the, some of the students as teachers. In, and so he was paying the students with what he got from the GI Bill plus money. So he was doing real well. And when the Cicados found this out, he didn't like the idea because he was making so much money. So he decided that we should all revolt, and we did. And we started a mural that was covered 500 square meters, which was in a, a converted chapel that was uh, which included a, a novel idea of how a mural should be done. Well, he called it the moving spectator. So you go in through one entrance and you look down towards the other end, and all the, the picture plane tilts so that it's, so you're facing always a picture plane. So whether you look left, up, down, in, wise, uh, the plane always faced you. That's what we call the moving spectator. And so that meant, meant that we had to uh, uh, distort the plane so that, so that all the lines converge so that they're always facing you, which was, I think, a good idea. Well, I talked that over with Orozco, who said uh, that the spectator isn't uh, so much, but the ideas should move in front of you, not, not the plane which, of course, again, is true. So you see each, uh, uh, each one of the mural painters had validity to what, what, they, what they practiced. And then I went and moved to Guadalajara and started teaching there and learning more about lithography. So uh, I, I was there about a year and a half, I think. And then I associated with the local artists. Some of them were writers. And um, uh, I did a, a back scenic design for the local symphony hall. And uh, eventually I went back to the United States and decided that uh, we should move to New York. So we moved to New York City. And I worked there with several galleries who were teaching art. And there again, I met a couple of important artists like Aja Yunkers, who was probably one of the best printmakers in the 60s. And uh, he was well known then. And so, uh, but later on, I, I eventually met him again and we did some lithographs, which he came to San Francisco to do. So, uh, I was beginning to get my foot in the door in New York. Then I decided that uh, if I did continue there, that I would have to pretty much stay there forever. And I didn't want to do that. Can I stop you for a second? Um, can, we, can we go like, can we go like um, decade by decade? Oh, Can you right. just say um, like in the 1950s, okay. yeah. I went okay. to New York and these are the things I did. 1960s, Okay. okay. Give, us, give us some framework too. Well, that was the early 50s that I, I, I'm bringing all this information up. And um, eventually I went back to Cleveland, Ohio in uh, 55. And by uh, lucky circumstances, I was hired to teach at Western Reserve University in Cleveland. And from there, there was a visiting artist by the name of Javier Gonzalez, who was a well-known watercolorist in the 30s in, in New York. and. Um, he was asked by the director of, uh, of the art department at the University of Illinois to to be to recommend somebody, and 
he recommended me. So I was interviewed and I got the job teaching at the University of Illinois. So I was there for about 10 years. And then I decided that I didn't care for the Midwest enough to, to stay there forever either. So I decided to go back to Mexico. So I went back to Mexico and was there uh, perhaps in the early 60s. And I decided to come back to the United States. And I applied, while I was at Illinois, I had a Ford Foundation grant to study etching, the, the process of preparing a stone for printing. And I spent a summer learning how to etch as well as I could. And um, then when I came back from Mexico, I applied for a grant at the Tamarind Institute because I heard that it was being formed. And um, I knew about it beforehand because uh, June Wayne, who the, became the director of the Tamarind Institute, uh, said that uh, she was applying for a grant to revive the art of lithography, which turned out that way. And she got the grant, and in 1960, the program for lithography investigation started. And uh, uh, it's a rocky beginning because, but there were several artists that were very well known at the time, like uh, Clinton Adams and Garrow and Creasian. And um, so the first few years, they were just kind of uh, learning how to deal with the matter of printing. And um, I, I went to a, a, a college art conference in Hollywood, and I visited Tamarind and left my prints there. And then about six months later, I was offered a fellowship. So then I went to Tamarind, and I was there for two years. Programs were usually only about three months each. Renewable contracts every three months. So at, at every three months, you were supposed to reach a plateau of some kind. You learn how to print crayon drawings. You learn how to print washes. You learn how to do all kinds of things. And on the basis of what you had done and showed proof of, uh, your contract would be renewed. Well, eventually, during that period, uh, I had learned just about everything there was to learn. So then I was hired on the staff. So I really became the first Latino printmaker, master printer. And what year was that? 65. And during that period, a well-known dealer here in San Francisco uh, went down there looking for uh, someone to run a shop or start a shop and saw what I was doing there and I was probably recommended by June May or someone, you know. So she offered me to come to San Francisco and open up this shop, which I did. It was called Collector's Press in 1967. And it was financed by a well-known art collector by the name of Beckman. He um, had just sold his business of uh, high-efficiency photographic equipment. And um, so I, I hired some, some printers from Tamarind because they, were grad they had graduated and they wanted to continue printing. So I had a succession of printers from Tamarind who were all very good, you know. Not as good as, uh, because they were freshly graduated, they didn't have as broad an experience as a, a good professional shop normally has over a lifetime of, of, of printing. So it was interesting and because I knew this gallery dealer, she associated with the museums in San Francisco and she uh, got them to recommend artists for us to, to, uh, to invite to work with, which turned out well too because they all of course know artists from all over. And, and gradually we just built up a, a well-known group of artists to our stable and uh, it went on like that for 27 years. Well, by that time, I had had a succession of partners from New York, from whatever means he was able to use 
to create his image. Well, he uses fingers, you know, and stuff like that. You, you can't have someone do that for you. You have to do it yourself, right? So that's why I thought that um, that was not necessarily the best way for an artist to, to work. Okay, anything else you want to throw in there? Well, I don't know. Is, is it time enough? That's plenty. Yeah. That's plenty, yeah. Enough time to point to the point A? Okay. That's All right. it then. All right, thank you. Good. Have our uh, interview and show the printing of his work and everything from here to start end. He did, uh, I think, seven or eight different images, and each one was talked about and how he was going to approach it and how it was done, how it was proofed, how he drew it. And I think it's a very good way to show to the public the, the nature of printmaking. So are you going to you going to let Notre Dame have a copy of that? Yeah, sure. Okay, and it's a film about Cuevas yes. in, in production. Yeah, it's it's very interesting because it was done for museums and stuff like the schools, you know, and it's very informative. And of course, that was done some years ago. And when he worked in the shop with me, he shows all the printers printing and the whole process. And the paper making that we had to make paper for printing and all kinds of different aspects. I think it's very entertaining too, besides technically good. Do you have other, other kinds of archival information that you might want to throw into the... Well, I think that uh, you don't yeah. have to you don't have to offer it right now. I'm just sort of thinking if you think about it and there's something you want to give to the. I give a lot of prints to to museums. No, I don't mean prints. I don't mean prints. Right. I mean, I mean well, things about your history. Oh. Well, I'm in history books. Yeah. First of all. Yeah. There's a book by James Officer called Spanish uh, America from 1550 1540 to 1853, and it covers the development of the whole Southwest by the settlers, and it's got genealogy, it's got my genealogy on my father's side and on my mother's side, but it's interesting reading, you know. What about, what about photographs that they might be able to copy? Yeah, I have photographs too. Okay, all right, why not? Good. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you too. Whatever it means he was able to use to create his image, well, he uses fingers, you know, and stuff like that. You, you can't have someone do that for you. You have to do it yourself, right? So that's why I thought that uh, that was not necessarily the best way for an artist to, to work. Okay, anything else you want to throw in there? Well, I don't know. Is, is it time enough? That's plenty. Yeah. That's plenty. Yeah. Enough time to point to the point A. Okay. That's All right. It then. All right. Thank you. Good. Have our uh, interview and show the printing of his work and everything from here to start end. He did, uh, I think, seven or eight different images, and each one was talked about and how he was going to approach it and how it was done, how it was proofed, how he drew it. And I think it's a very good way to show to the public the, the nature of printmaking. So are you gonna are you gonna let Notre Dame have a copy of that? Yeah, sure. Okay. And it's a film about Cuevas yes. in, in production. Yeah, it's it's very interesting because it was done for museums and stuff like the schools, you know. And it's very informative and of course that was done some years ago. And when he worked in the shop with me, he shows all the printers printing and the whole process. And the paper making that we had to make paper for printing and all kinds of different aspects. I think it's very entertaining too, besides technically good. Do you have other, other kinds of archival information that you might want to throw into the... Well, I think that uh, you don't yeah. have to. You don't have to offer it right now. I'm just sort of thinking if you think about it, and there's something you want to give to the. I give a lot of prints to to museums. No, I don't mean prints. I don't mean prints. Right. I mean, I mean well, things about your history. 
Oh. Well, I'm in history books. Yeah. First of all. Yeah. There's a book by James Officer called Spanish uh, America from 1550, 1540 to 1853. And it covers the development of the whole Southwest by the settlers. And it's got genealogy, it's got my genealogy on my father's side and on my mother's side. But it's interesting reading, you know. What about, what about photographs that they might be able to copy? Yeah, I have photographs too. Okay, all right. Bueno. Good. Thank you. Thank you.